Coming to you from Guthrie City Hall, this is The Roundup. Welcome to a special edition of The Roundup. Glad to have you on board as we are coming to you from City Hall here in beautiful downtown Guthrie. I'm Chris Evans. Again, thanks for joining us. We are joined here today, Senator A.J. Griffin, Senate District 20, Representative John Pfeiffer, District 38, and Kevin Wallace, District 32. Appreciate you guys joining us, and uh, great, good to have you back again, uh, Representative Wallace. We had you a couple of years at the parade, and uh, good to see you back here in Guthrie. My pleasure. Thanks for having me here today, Chris. Of course, you're all mostly in Lincoln County. Get a smidge over there in, uh, in uh, Logan County for our folks over there in eastern Logan County. That's right. I have Langston and uh, Meridian here in Logan County. And uh, Representative Pfeiffer, all the way down the, near the city limits. Yeah, I, I actually go into the city. I, I get... I get Missy's Donuts, my one big claim to fame yes. in Guthrie, and, and the high school and stuff like that, but the donuts are the important thing. Absolutely, <laughs> and AJ, you go from here to New York and back over and to back California, again. right? Yeah. Kingfisher, Logan, Noble, and Pawnee Counties, the heart of North Central Oklahoma and the best part of the state of Oklahoma, in my opinion. Absolutely. All of the best communities. And you guys had busy, busy years. I mean, I, all the emails I got on everything you passed, Senator Griffin, was amazing. And then, you two guys, everything you guys passed had an XX on the end of it, so you guys had a lot of, <laughs> lot of inner fun, fun times. Yeah, we, we were in special session for, I think it ended up being 16, 17 months, something like that, mm -hmm. and finally came up with a good solution, and, and things just got a lot better after, after we were finally able to get something passed. Of course, it was a busy time. There were so many different things, moving parts, the entire deal, but uh, the biggest part, $7.6 billion budget was passed and there was a lot of back and forth, many months, many uh, press conferences, all that fun stuff, but uh, finally got the 7.6 and of course you were kind of right in the middle of all that stuff as the chairman of the A&B Appropriations and Budgets Committee. We, we and actually said we started working on that budget finally to pass it literally, I believe, May 12, 2016. If you go back and look at all the revenue, that, that was the first time we had a revenue package on the floor and it was for just a buck fifty on cigarettes. and. Uh, of course, we couldn't pass that, and we had many attempts at, at larger packages and even some bigger packages, and then we condensed it down a little bit. To get to the negotiation, you know, revenue's got to start in the House. Basically, the way it works in the building, whether or not you love it or hate it, but if everybody's not in agreement, that's the House, the Senate, and the Governor, it doesn't happen. So as we started working on negotiations, we always had the three principles basically in negotiations with the Speaker, Pro Tem, and the Governor. So we could never come up with a package that we could get the 76th threshold in the House. The Senate was able to do it. Revenue bills that we'd sent to them, modify them a bit, changing them up, send them back with three quarters votes. But uh, it finally came down to a point where the House just started having to negotiate with the Senate, or excuse me, the House Republicans and Democrats to come up with a package that we could pass the threshold of. And a big part of that, obviously, was the education part and the teacher walkout. And, you, and you, as you guys are going through the process of doing what you guys got to do to pass all this stuff, but with the more involvement from the public, it was kind of a, an education for people how this legislative process works as well. So you kind of had a, this is what we're doing, this is how it works, and that, and that was a, uh, another uh, deal on its own. Well, I know I spent quite a bit of the time uh, when we were joined by all uh, our teachers, um, and that was an exciting two weeks at the Capitol. It was great to have so much constituent involvement. We, but we spent a lot of that, that time teaching, um, teaching the teachers and teaching our education community on the intricacies of, of the process. And, you know, everybody says, well, you just, you just do what makes sense. And I said, it makes sense to you, but we have a lot of people that are, are part of this process. And, and, you know, all of the new revenue is dedicated towards education. And I think that was the general consensus among our colleagues that that's really th where we thought we needed to make that investment. Um, it is, it, there's moving parts to the budget every year and nothing is permanent. Um, every, the legislature will convene again next year and, and we'll have an opportunity to, to write a different budget and every year we, we have to write a balanced budget so it's going to look different. But it was nice to see movement finally um, and we are constrained by the highest threshold in the country when it comes to raising new revenues and to, to get anything done at this point with that challenge I think um, everybody involved in the process deserves a lot of credit. Went one day to the walkout and there's teachers everywhere and they had a program, it was like a football program, they had pictures of all the legislators and where they're from and all that process but uh, what was it like for you? It was really interesting to me, uh, of course both my parents were teachers uh, actually here in Guthrie 
And, and you kind of get a sense of how old your parents really are when you have teachers from Guthrie coming in and saying, I had your dad, he was my science teacher, and yeah. now, now I'm a teacher. Uh, so that was really fun, and I was trying to remember all those names so I could tell him. And I think once you had a lot of teachers get up there and realize that we're just normal people, um, you know, representing the people we care about, and we voted to try to get stuff done, and stuff can't happen overnight, but it is a give and take, and just getting them better involved and in seeing the process, I think it was not only extremely helpful this year, but I think it's going to be extremely helpful in, in years to come. And it's also going to show how we have to, you know, as we prioritize, we have to have these uh, stories and these lessons from the teachers in the community themselves. And, and it's something that Guthrie knows firsthand about, uh, trying to pass the bond issues. And, and so I think Guthrie teachers had, had a leg up because they'd, they'd been through something very similar to this um, back in their own hometown. Uh, so they were able to come up and kind of be better advocates for their kids. How are you guys able to, not you guys personally, but as a body, take, you know, people always talk about, well, they've been messing this up for 20 years. Well, you were, you guys were elected in 2014, you were elected in 2012, and it's not like you were the problem 20 years ago, but, you know, guilt you know, by association type of that. How do you guys handle that? Keep well, it personal <clears throat> out of the way. You know, and dealing with the threshold, I mean, that came out of the events that happened over House Bill 1017. Uh, at the time, to raise revenue was a simple majority of 51 votes. It took them 14 months to pass House Bill 1017. Um, as a knee-jerk reaction, then the public come back out, initiative ballot, raised the threshold to 75%, both Senate and the House. Um, so the fact it's taken us that long to finally pass revenue is because of the constraints put on us basically by the public, um, you know, we're, we're kind of seeing a knee-jerk reaction again right now this time. Um, I can tell you looking at the numbers, and I, I've been entrenched for two years on really the state of the state as far as covering core services of government, the cost, the cuts that we've made over the last 10 years. Um, the fact that we've been in a three-year recession was pretty traumatic for the state uh, because we never could raise a little revenue. You know, hindsight, and, and as I look at it, if we could have passed that buck fifty cigarette two years ago, we wouldn't have needed a bigger revenue package this time. We'd have had a little help along the way, and the fact that the economy is recovering would have just, I think, almost got us over the threshold. If we'd had that money two years ago and then again last year, and then we'd had a much smaller package this time to finish up the needs that we, we had as far as education goes, um, DHS, um, DOC, I mean, those were the big increases on the budget, but every agency had an increase because of the state employee pay raises. Yeah, 400 million toward education, and just a little bit of breakdown for, uh, a lot of forget, was the $6,100 increase for teachers, and I don't know if we went from, I forget, number 19, 29, something like that, as far as teacher pay, but then when you, get, you got the wild card, uh, possibly coming up with the Oklahoma Taxpayer, Taxpayers Unite, is that, they got enough votes yet for or signatures for that? I don't believe the signatures have been certified okay. yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay. There's but been two contests of that, so it's over in the Supreme Court. There's basically a stay. I mean, the 90-day period is stopped. I expect the court will probably make a decision within a couple of weeks whether or not they're going to hear oral argument or if they're going to make a ruling or they're going to kick it out. Um, but time is of the essence, and especially that 90-day window from the time we signed he died, special session number two, mm -hmm. is the window for them to collect 90 days after that. But now that they've stocked the clock with, you know, contesting the state question, um, hopefully the Supreme Court takes up the action pretty quickly. Is that frustrating? You did all this work, a couple of years you talk about, and then it's going, these, you know, uh, you, Taxpayers Unite, Tom Coburn, in the face of that, it seems that, uh, your thoughts on, on them, because what's, what's the plan for them to cover $480 million? They say the money's there, is that right? Is that what they say? Well, <coughs> I'm not sure. I, I've heard yeah. some numbers, basically about 60% of it they believe is there. Um, and that's based on the economy re recovery and improvement. Um, we still have other areas that I think needs attention. Uh, so, you know, Every person's going to have to look within themselves and decide what they want to do. Yeah. I can tell you my votes speak for themselves. I won't be signing the petition. I won't be voting for it. Uh, I've cast my vote for the last yeah. couple of years. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and you, and you get into areas where what some people call fraud, waste, and abuse, it, it's not fraud, waste, and abuse. It's genuine disagreements on whether or not the government 
should be funding these areas or not. It's genuine policy discussions. So just because someone labels something fraud, waste, and abuse, it they could just be they disagree with how the state is legally spending the money. Um, you know, you could you could say that you know the Oklahoma Water Resources Board is fraud, waste, and abuse just because you don't like the way they administer the state's water rights. But they're not abusing it. They're not wasting it. They're doing it within the parameters of the law. And I think that's a whole lot of what's what's going on here. That things get labeled something that sounds way worse. You know, they get labeled fraud, waste, and abuse, and in actuality it's just genuine disagreements about priorities and how we should be spending money. And an example is, you know, we, the Department of Human Services budget was increased by $22 million, which sounds like a significant increase. It allowed us to restore some of the previous cuts. Um, foster care reimbursement, so those families that are caring for children um, in, in state custody but I don't think anyone thinks that's wasted money to add additional dollars there. Uh, we are going to make a small move forward to addressing the needs of families that are caring for their loved ones that have severe de uh, developmental disabilities, which is what we call the waiting list, which are several thousand Oklahomans whose caregivers could go go back to work, could, could uh, work full-time instead of part-time if we could provide some just basic services, but we haven't been able to pay for um, many of those services in the, back, uh, in the past. So that $22 million, um, all of it was invested in improving the lives of vulnerable Oklahomans. Yeah. Is, is that waste? And I don't, I, most Oklahomans don't agree that that's waste. That we agree that that's the type of society that we want to live in is uh, the, the ones that we care for, our individuals, and they are elderly, are disabled, and our kids. And there's a lot of, you know, I saw the post the other day, 100 children placed in basically shelters, uh, you know, uh, funding, trying to find foster, more foster. We've done, we've made huge strides and huge advancements in child welfare in Oklahoma. A lot of it has been because of financial investment. Um, we got sued because we weren't spending enough money to do the job well. Um, but we, we haven't arrived yet. We ha still have kids that are, because of the severity of their disabilities, their emotional um, trauma that they've suffered, and because of their special needs, are just really hard to find um, placements for. And we have yet to, to fill that gap in our system. Still trying to do it with some old models, um, partially because it takes money, it takes investment, and uh, those are services that, that cost a lot. They're ex extremely expensive. Well, you mentioned State Health Department. They're in the news right now, a $30 million deal, grand jury investigation, and uh, they, they needed $30 million last year to find out after an investigation. Uh, money was pop likely there, a slush fund and all that good stuff, but uh, your initial reactions to uh, hearing that news and after all the work you guys went through to find out, oh, not to mention the 200 people that lost their job and had to go through the process and all that good stuff. The time that they needed or come to us and said we need the 30 million to make payroll uh, to get through basically the rest of the fiscal year uh, was at a time we, we hadn't passed revenue yet either. We did not have it. It was the last cash that we had on hand. Um, so for me, after I heard that, it's very disheartening how things could go awry for that long. Uh, I think it's very important we have to have one set of accounting which health department had their own separate accounting based on I would say probably the slush fund that was set up now they're looking at maybe 40 years ago uh, long before any of us were in the legislature but uh, we, we, we have to have more oversight and accountability. We had a bill that we passed through the House this, this past uh, session for the Office of Accountability to have CPAs that report directly to the legislature. And that's truly what needs to happen. Um, but we, we didn't get it across the finish line. We do have the uh, some performance audits scheduled for about two million investment in that for this uh, 19. But, um, you know, the Attorney General said that uh, Hunter thought that we ought to take that full 30 million and invest it in audits. Um, that would have to get consensus. I don't know that we need to spend the full 30 million, but if the House and the Senate and the Governor all agreed, we probably could. But I do think we need to put more of an investment in performance audits. Real quick, is there a price on an audit? I've always heard they're expensive, but is there a price on an audit for a department like that? It depends on the variable of an audit. I mean, there's a performance audit, there's a forensic audit. It's been pointed out that the legislature's cut the auditor's budget 40% over the last 10 years. Well, 
Eighty percent of the agencies have been cut, an average of forty percent. When you start breaking down the numbers on the budget, you have the top ten agencies eat up ninety-three percent of the budget of the appropriation. So the other fifty-six, seven of them are getting seven point some percent, or you know, very small amount of money after you take the top ten out. So uh, goes back to your question there before. I think that. The state's where it needs to be. I think we passed a good, solid budget. I, I know we needed the increase in revenue. If um, we will let the economy run its course, we can start investing where we need to as far as the audits, uh, bring some of these agencies back up that have been cut over the last 10 years. And no cuts this year? No cuts. Everybody had an increase this year. And I think this, the, the, with, the, with what happened in the health department shows how we need to continue to try to change to change how government's structured. Um, in Oklahoma, we it's like the seventh largest constitution in the world. I know we talk about that a lot. Um, but everything, uh, we're so scared of centralized power that everything is run by its own individual board and commission. Um, and then they're the ones who actually hire, fire directors and things like that. And then as far as the House and the Senate goes, we're only, we don't have the staff to, to, uh, to audit these agencies. So we're working with the numbers that they provide to us. So if they provide us false numbers or say we need this much money and, and are, it, we, we're making bad decisions based off faulty information. Um, so as we continue to move some of the stuff forward and we've changed, uh, we passed a couple of these bills, uh, direct appointments by the governor to give the governor's power to go in and say, okay, you're not doing a good job running your agency and kind of clean it up. It, sort of take Oklahoma and move it to a little more like the federal model where a governor appoints and the, the Senate confirms, which is what most people assume already happens and it's, it's actually not the case. A lot of times because of all of our past mistakes and mistrust and stuff, we've really tied our hands in what we can do and we end up having systems that are just almost designed to fail. A little bit. You And you work close with State Health Department on a lot of things and, and there's no apparently no criminal activity, just mismanagement. Right, and, and that was the conclusion of, of the, the, um, the committee that was reviewing everything and of course was concurred by, by both the auditor and the attorney general. So they don't believe there was any, anything that was uh, criminal, criminal war acts that were occurred. There was um, misleading behaviors. Although I would say that I, I feel as a legislator that we were lied to. Um, and also extremely disappointed in, in some of the management decisions that were made over the last several years, cutting some very important funding for things like our federally qualified health centers. So, you know, Mary Mahoney there in Langston has lost funding because of some of the decisions that were made by the previous leadership. But I did meet this morning with Tom Bates. I have started affectionately calling Tom Bates the Olivia Pope of state government in Oklahoma. Um, he has been moved around and is now directly appointed by the governor to act as the interim director of the Oklahoma State Department of Health. And um, Tom just said just this morning that actions have started to try to recall some of those uh, rift employees when we had the reduction in force. So those employees have been notified that there would be opportunities for them to have a, have a chance to come back to either their previous position or a similar similar position and those notices have gone out. Many of those folks have gone, have moved on. They've got other jobs, but they do intend to begin to retool uh, the State Department of Health because many of those positions were lost in our county offices. Um, they weren't from the central office. They were actually from outlying areas. And so, and I know those of us that represent rural Oklahoma weren't very happy about that. Uh, so, because that can frequently be the only access to health care some of our rural residents have, and it's a very integral part of our health care system. So I know they're, they're working to do that as well. And then of course, um, we will still have to actually figure out the funding that is available. I think it's unwise to immediately recall those uh, additional funds until the new director has an opportunity to find a qualified CFO and let them have an opportunity to work and give the legislature a true picture of the financial position of that agency. And that doesn't happen overnight. How rural hospitals, nursing homes, what, how the budget help uh, forecast for them? The Oklahoma Healthcare Authority, which oversees the Medicaid program, 
did receive funding increases. Um, we were able to, to do a 2% to, to most of our rates and then a 3% rate increase to long-term care. So our nursing homes received the, the largest rate increase uh, of the provider network. And then within the Department of Human Services, the part of the Medicaid program that's housed there, we also were able to, through the work of, of the appropriations chairs, be able to get uh, rate increases there as well. So those uh, seniors that receive Advantage Waiver Program services in their home, their providers received a, a significant increase. Our developmental disabilities uh, community, the prov current pro list of providers received a rate increase as well. So some of it was actually restoring previous cuts. Um, they took a, a three and a half percent uh, rate cut a couple of years ago. We were able to restore that cut and then give another three and a half percent bump. Um, I wish I could say that that rate increase in long-term care now covers the cost of running a nursing home. It still doesn't. It, it still doesn't. Um, as the, the intensity of nursing home residence care has increased as we've been able to keep healthy people out of nursing homes, it just costs more. And so we still have work to do in that area for sure. But, but it's still a huge step forward as opposed to the steps oh, back we've been better. taking the past <laughs> couple of years. Um, but we're, we're, we're going to see, um, I, I mean, what we did this year is going to help rural hospitals and rural nursing homes. Uh, and, and that's been the fear of well, the last well, the last three years that, that we, we've been there, it's always been you, you come to budget time and we're, we're trying to make the cuts where we have to, and then people who run nursing homes write you letters and say, okay, a, a cut to our provider rate is risking shutting the doors of our nursing homes. And this is the first time we've finally been able to turn that tide and say, listen, we're, we're not going to do that. Your, your nursing homes are not at, not at risk. Uh, risks this year, which is a, a huge step forward, especially when it comes to, you know, rural nursing homes and rural hospitals. Well, one other thing that, that did draw some attention but kind of slipped through the cracks was Healthcare Authority, we, we gave a supplement of 31 million for 18 and we committed 110 million for 19 in their budget for the GMEs, the graduate medical schools um, education, which federal government pulled our waiver back from the last quarter of FY17 and all of 18. Basically the federal money was about 62 million a year and when they pulled back the last quarter of 17 and all of 18 left a gap for us and then to plan on 19, uh, 141 million that we put additional into that program that we had no anticipation prior to the first special session was gonna have to do that. Um, we have firmed up to make sure that our pipeline for our physicians, especially for rural healthcare, still in place. Uh, we've had contact or I've had contact with uh, the OSU and OU medical uh, universities that uh, to make sure the residents are comfortable and assured that we're going to fund that in the future. Um, we're still applying for waivers but on the federal level it, the federal money is getting pulled back. Um, so basically what I said on the, on, this, on the side for going forward 62 million I think we need to sit down and have a conversation where that needs to come through. Is it healthcare authority? Is it higher ed? I mean, it is education, it is medical, maybe a split, but it's gonna take some more discussion. But that's another piece of the budget that was huge, uh, that really has kind of been overlooked. I gotta see the county commissioners at least three times a month and they're always CIRB and the fund that's been, what, what's, where are we at on that? I know they're, you know, they're looking for uh, funding for you know all the county roads, especially rural Oklahoma. Yeah, uh, the the county roads and bridge fund or the CIRB fund has has been one of the one of the main sources of money we've gone to when we try to balance the state budget. I I do want to point out is, is as much as I live down a dirt road and like to have it graded as as often as possible. Monty, you do a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, up until ten years ago. The county didn't get any money from the state to do that type of stuff. We set up the CIRB fund. We did it. Um, it should. It has a cap on it. We reach our cap from time to time. Um, what made this year worse was during the first. Trying to. I'll get my numbers confused. But during the first FY18 budget, we took 30 million dollars out of CIRB. When we came back into the second special session. First first special session um, and we were going to take an additional 50 million out after we couldn't pass 
Uh, I think that one was A plus or whatever. They're, they all start running together after a while, but we're going to take an additional $50 million out of CRRB to budget stuff. When the governor, what we did procedurally uh, was we went through and we reopened up the FY18 budget and rewrote it. Um, and so we took the 30 million, added 50 to it, and said we were going to take 80 million total out of CIRB. And then later on, there was some repeal language where we repealed the, the 30 million dollars. Well, when the governor line itemed the budget, by a clerical error, she line itemed out the repealer. So we ended up taking 30 million plus an additional 80 out of CIRB. Well, it was House Bill 1019. X that she uh, 170 section bill she vetoed 165 she knew exactly what she was vetoing what she wasn't in order to pull that extra money but going back and getting to your question uh, there there is a cap of 120 million we've been reaching that every year that we ran a piece of legislation in the second special session that was um, I think House Bill 10. 14 double X, which was misinformed or publicized that we were taking the money away from education and giving it to roads and bridges on the fuel tax. That bill did two things. One, in the second year, it did divert the uh, fuel tax money to the roads fund, which is kind of the state ODOT. Mm -hmm. uh, then we pulled down the dollars that we're sending up there. It's got a cap of 100 or 575 million. We're hitting that every year but we're paying for a lot of that out of income tax out of GR, so we're pulling dollar for dollar swap back down. The other part of the bill that no one really talked about was uh, the CERB fund. When it hits the cap before we pass this, this 1014 bill, when it hit the cap, the money would fall back into GR, spill over into GR. We changed it where now it spills back up and goes into roads, and we still pull dollar for dollar back out of the roads uh, fund into GR, and then we can appropriate that wherever we need it, education, healthcare, you know, wherever it's needed at. The Association of Commissioners have come to talk to me. Um, they would like to have their 50 million back. Actually, they want 130 million back. Back pay? <laughs> yeah, back pay. <laughs> um, but, but I will tell you, and I ran the bill on the floor of 1019, the first one that was lined on and vetoed significantly. In the five-year plan, which is the CERB plan, for FY18 requirements were um, 222 million. And the day I ran the bill, there was 203 million in it that would go ahead and continue to get its monthly increments to hit the cap. If the governor hadn't changed the veto in, in the structure, the 50 million that we were taking was not going to impact FY18 at all. Uh, the additional 30 has, mm -hmm. uh, but it's got it down to where it's very, very close. Um, so I've given them my word. I mean, I'm going to work with them, try to get a supplement back to them to replace some of that money, perhaps. Uh, they've asked for if we would just raise the cap up for a certain amount of time till they could recoup that money. That's another option. Um, once you change something in statute, though, it's hard to change it back unless you put a sunset on it. So we'll, we'll see how that works out. But um, I personally do believe that they need part of their money back. Trying to figure out a better way as, as we go forward to continue to fund county roads and bridges is something that we continually work on, uh, whether, it's, whether it's adjusting the cap. The, the big problem with the CIRB fund is not every county uses it the same. Some counties use the CIRB fund um, money that's allocated to them and they keep it in the fund and, and basically use it as a bank account until they can pay for something. Uh, some counties like ours pull it out, you put it with city, uh, county sales tax money, use it as matching money and roll through. We've, we need to find a more unified way to do it so that the balance of the CIRB fund more accurately kind of shows what's going on. As, as we have some of these counties, specifically in the eastern half of the state, that continue to use it like a bank account, it, it pushes up and it, the money that's spilling over, over the cap, is basically from the counties that are using their CIRB money. So we're going to continue to look and try to address that as we go forward because we do know it is a problem. Another deal before we get to some of the current topics is the uh, uh, the prison population more more prisoners and beds to talk about what the budget does for, to help that and there's some laws that in there as well there's way. there's two million dollars um, total that that, that uh, was, is to be invested in some of the criminal justice reform now 
Obviously, we, we passed several pieces of legislation around criminal justice reform, reducing sentencing, good time credits, those types of things. And then the state question, previously passed state questions, are still kind of measuring the impact of, of those. But the diversion programs that are really necessary, um, those are, are generally managed by the Department of Health and Substance Abuse Services, and there was additional funding. Um, so most of that will be invested in what's called an offender screening program. Uh, and then the rest will, will go to expand our specialty courts, the drug court and the mental health courts that are available and some veterans courts that are available across the state because those have, we didn't need to do anything new. We just need to invest more in some of the programs we know that are, are appropriately and successfully diverting people away from going to prison. And, and I think everybody here in Logan County is familiar with the success of the drug court program. In this county, we have, have a very strong drug court program and very supportive um, judge, judge Dual does a great job managing that court and we fully utilize all of those slots that are available and the treatment that goes on out at Logan Community Services. So the goal there is just to make more of it available because we know it works. Um, not every county um, even now has access to drug court and is fully is utilizing that diversion system and that's one of the goals is to eventually make sure that that's available statewide and would be a, a major uh, change in the number of people who are sending to, to prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not every not every county. Um, we we just have not funded it, and uh, of of course you have to have um, supervising judges that are willing and and district attorneys that find the value of do you uh, doing a diversion program. And we've been very lucky here that we do have that. Across the entire budget, there was eleven million for criminal justice reform. Part of it was in mental health. Part of it was DAs. Part of it was in DOC. Um, DOC's budget was increased 34.4 million this year. 4.8 of that was for a offender management software program um, to help keep track of time for both good behavior, behavior and bad and perhaps early parole. Uh, we put some more money in the parole board also. That's part of that 11 million that was spread out throughout the budget. Um, we, we, are, we did run the uh, ability for bonding for the maintenance and operation uh, I've had many meetings with the director of uh, ABA with DOC. I believe that they'll be coming out with a more comprehensive plan because based on the infrastructure needs that we have just to manage and operate, um, I ask him if you had one new prison, what comes off the list? If you had two new prisons, what comes off the list? Um, just because we approved that bond, it's in a series bond also, so it doesn't all have to be bonded at once and then you start paying that service on it, it can be piecemealed in as, as time proves that you need it and you can spend it. And then I'm hoping before we go back into session that we have a written plan, uh, an RFP out for proposals for two new prisons perhaps, different locations, Department of Corrections will make the final decision, uh, but there will be efficiencies and cost savings with a new prison. So we're in that process, we just don't have solid answers yet. DOC is still stuck in the in the late 1980s as far as technology goes. Um, they're they're figuring out good time behavior and, and parole uh, on paper. There's a huge well, it's a former gymnasium that's just a huge warehouse now that houses all the paper uh, that's not even digitized. Um, I know their computer system uh, under the previous director. Uh, was not upgraded like it should have been and then the company that actually wrote the software went out of business and so it's 15 to 20 years old which most of us can't make a phone work after two to three years much less manage a huge offender network. Um, so as we continue to bring that stuff forward uh, we also had some important policy changes. Uh, we opened up some positions uh, on the parole board to allow people with mental health experience to get on the parole board um, and, and as we continue to upgrade our criminal justice system um, where it still protects public safety but it but it allows for the fact that we're we do things differently now that that we recognize that some of this is mental health problems um, that some of these people will be better served going through a drug court program than being incarcerated um, it, it's going to eventually start addressing these things we've just it's it takes a it takes a little while to fix and it takes a little while for these changes to make its way through the process
All right, one more thing before we get to the topics. And I think you ran out of time, I think, this session, pick up the wind tax type deal. There's the, the $7 million question. Do we live up to what we say? Do we go back on what we say and quit cutting the check? Up to $70 million. Where, did we run out of time? Is that right? Did I re, do I recall right? There were competing proposals, yeah. and I think there was a game of chicken, and nobody won, and nobody okay. lost All at right. this point. So, <laughs> but it, the, I think the important thing for everybody to note is that there are no new tax credits being issued to anyone producing electricity using wind generation. That's that's the, the most important part of it for me. And that lower reimbursement, we right. did away with that. We've got two years left to finish up that obligation or commitment. It just comes across that they're they're making a lot of money, and we're still sending them a, a check. I personally think there is a win in this for everyone, and I was pushing or selling, put a cap at 50 million, put a GPT tax prospective going forward on any new construction, new bid for electric power, whenever they up their contracts, mm -hmm. or any time they retool. At some point in time, all of them would be back paying GPT, but it'd be going forward. Um, this year, the, the, the number was 72.4 million that we, for zero emissions credit that we wrote out. From a budgetary standpoint, if I had a constant stable number at 50 million and talked to uh, some producers here in the state, uh, they would be paid back in 11 years, so it's not really extending the time too far, but it's flat because it's on a bell curve. And as the number starts to drop off, we would still say at 50, they would start paying GPT, it would all start to roll together, and they would be paying for part of their credit before 11 years pass. But that proposal didn't, didn't make it. Didn't make it. The, the problem becomes when produces electricity. We've always taxed things that produce electricity on an ad valorem basis. And if we're going to change that, um, which, which, which we can do, uh, it, it's, it, it takes time to completely change a tax structure on an entire industry. And, and so we took the first steps this year and are going to continue negotiations as we move forward. And it is an industry that we need to remember produces electricity that everybody uses and eventually the end user will pick up the tab to any increase in cost. So it's not you're just we're going to make these big bad companies from out of state pay the bill. Eventually right. we will all be paying that bill. All right, moving on. Uh, medical marijuana questions coming in front of the, uh, the voters. 788 thinks the state question there. A lot of people saying it's a gateway to legalizing marijuana, to the way the bill was written. We'll all have a vote on it, but it's kind of back and forth of what, uh, what side you want to believe. Well, it's a state question that will be on the ballot. The voters will decide what happens with, with it, with, with the issues that it does have. I mean, I know that I've, I've spoken to employers. I think the employers are the most concerned because of the prohibitions on testing for, an in, for someone, and, and so we'll have to work out those kinks. But it's another thing that, the, according to the state question, the regulations fall on the State Department of Health. And... Um, the interim director and I had the visit about that this morning as well. He said it would take, uh, there are requirements for eight new state licenses if this is t to pass. Um, the bureaucracy that is included in that state question is significant and with a very short window of opportunity for the agency to get that up and running. It isn't free. There's a cost associated. He estimates somewhere between four and five million dollars of immediate cost to the State Department of Health in order to be ready to implement it with that current timeline. So of course um, the state questions in statute, so those are things that the legislature can can make changes to. Um, as a comparison, this is a 90-day timeline turnaround um, via after passage, whereas the state question that changed the way that we sell alcohol, which has been legal for decades, um, there was a two-year timeline for implementation. So it's a, it will be a challenge. Um, I'm not sure the response we'll have. I know that the, the most of the elected officials, and we'll see what these two guys say, but I think we'll say we'll, we'll see what the, the voters have to say first and then respond to the will of people. And the district attorneys weren't, aren't, aren't really not on board with this either because it makes a tough decision for law enforcement officers. There's a lot of pushback from lots of different groups, whether it's law enforcement, district attorneys, um, employers. Uh, health care, uh, people who rent houses and stuff because it changes whether or not you can have marijuana in rent houses, things like that. There's, 
I, I just highly encourage everybody to go through and, and read the ballot language beforehand and, and make an informed decision uh, because there are some things that, that we are going to have to change if this does pass. And, and I think that's a thing that, that everybody needs to be aware of, that there's, there are some things uh, that, are, that are highly undoable. I mean, the fact that we have to have licenses, that this thing needs to be implemented 90 days after passage. Um, is going to be an extremely tough lift, if not impossible, to do that we might have to go back in and, and tweak some of the stuff. And we're not, we're not over, uh, overwhelming the will of the people. We're making this changes so it can work. One of the things that, that truly scares me about it is it sets a tax structure at 7% as opposed to like Colorado, who it, and it is different. It's fully legalized marijuana there. But Colorado taxes their marijuana at 30% and is still having some struggles funding the agencies that are in, in charge of licensing this stuff. Uh, I, I do think a 7% tax on, on this is extremely low, especially for all the licenses that are going to have to be processed and all the, all the things that are going to have to go along with this. We have, we have a bad habit of, of underfunding things specifically to begin with. And, and it's hard to go back and change it. And when we start out already so far behind on what it's going to cost to make these things run efficiently, um, it's, it raises some red flags for me. The medical part of it, a lot of people say there's a lot of pros, but maybe it's just not, the, the, me the ballot measure is just not worded the way it should be for the medical part of it. Yeah, I've talked to several district attorneys who've basically called it legalized weed with a permission slip. And the question comes up, and literally four years ago, the first time I ran, and four and a half years ago, knocking door after door after door, uh, medical marijuana has come up even in the primary voters' request. Uh, I think it's something that will probably pass. The state question definitely needs some work. But, but we're going to be in a catch-22 if it passes, and then we go back to straighten up or clean up some language. Uh, whether or not we're going against the will of the people, it's going to be very challenging. I think you're going to see a big surplus of money spent in opposition before June 26th. In opposition, and I think to kind of debunk some of the things that are being said, because I don't think anybody's opposed to, to medical marijuana. I know the hospital association is saying we would support medical marijuana, just not the way this question is written. And I think it's also important to point out um, in our first year, we passed uh, CBD oil, which is completely legal here in the state of Oklahoma, which according to all of the doctors I've talked to is the medical portion of marijuana, uh, is completely legal here in the state of Oklahoma. It's what they use to treat seizures and, and a myriad of other things. I saw CBD infused water the other day. Um, so, so we have that. I just think before anyone votes on it, try to read the language. Um, and, and think about where this is going to come and, and whether or not if we, if we want legalized marijuana are we better off passing something differently or are we better off with the legislature passing something that's been fully vetted or do we want this which is again what the district attorney said basically legalized weed with a permission slip. We have a regulatory structure for medicine, medications. It uses physicians and licensed pharmacists. This is outside of that. So it, if it's medicine, then it's medicine. That's what I was, yeah, yeah. That, that's, yeah. <laughs> that sums up perfectly what yeah. I was trying, trying to get at. But uh, real quickly, the last one, uh, constitutional carry, uh, 21, I, I think both, both passed and got vetoed, right? Is that am I correct? Uh, right. 12, 12. Uh, without 12, a 12. 12, 12. There you go. Without a background check and all that. It's 21 without a felony and no background check. And uh, You'd still have to have a background check when you purchased a firearm, uh, the, the, same as, the same as you do right now. Uh, just allow you to carry without having to go through a concealed carry class. Um, and it, like I said, it passed out of the House, it passed out of the Senate, the governor vetoed it. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is an issue that's not going to go away. Yes. It'll be yeah. back. And so we will see it again and we'll continue to vote for it and we'll see what happens after, the, after a gubernatorial election. Of course, it's campaign season for you guys. AJ, I mean, I, it, it stopped everyone in their tracks there when you said uh, you weren't going to seek re-election. I never intended to do this as a, a, a career forever. It was an extension of the public service that I enjoyed in my, all of my previous positions serving this community. And I'm looking forward to it. And everybody keeps saying, I can't wait to hear what you're going to do right. next. Um, neither can I. <laughs> um, I, I. I'm in 
conversations with mo multiple groups, but I can uh, tell you that I'll be back closer doing the things that I love, which is working with direct providers that are caring for Oklahomans and, and um, our families and the health of our communities and what's happening. So I'm going to wind up going back to that part of public service, but it's been an honor. Um, and it has definitely been my pleasure to represent my hometown uh, of Guthrie and the surrounding communities at the state capitol. For, and I'm not finished yet. I mean, if you need anything over the summer, I'm still, I don't have to campaign, which is a lot of right. fun. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, I get to you're play, like yeah, comfortable I get, over here. Right? I get to play the Monday morning quarterback on all these guys' campaign. They're both on the ballot, and I'd like to see both of them come back for sure. And then there's a lot of folks that are vying for um, both my position. And then, of course, Representative Murphy is term limited, so he won't be back so we replace uh, have a new face in that position as well one of the things I always wanted to make sure I got finished before I left though was addressing the uh, publishing museum yes and that situation so as an update on that I want to invite um, everybody from Guthrie to the Chamber Coffee on June the 27th where we will officially transfer the ownership of the um, the publishing museum back to the community uh, of Guthrie and to the nonprofit that was started to reestablish that as a, a space for um, this community and hopefully get the local community to invest in it again with the assistance and the cheerleading of the state uh, state historical society so we'll have an official ceremony where we actually sign the paperwork and and make that transfer and so that building will again belong to the citizens of, the, of Guthrie um, and not to the entire state well congratulations I mean you had you had a I mean, just the the awards and honors and emails I get uh, but uh, but congratulations and uh, best of luck on your on your next thanks Chris adventure, I appreciate it. whatever the, that may be, but uh, you guys got a tough job. I've never been an elected official. I mean, as soon as you put your name on the ballot, you lose half your friends. But you guys, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got you got a professional. And you guys got a tough job. It's sometimes not a thankless job, but uh, it's uh, it's a job well done. And uh, congratulations on the year. Appreciate a little bit of your time here today. And uh, again, congratulations on uh, your next adventure. Thank, thank you, Quitter. Chris. I'm sure we'll get that out there soon yeah, uh, when that becomes available. As soon as I know, you'll know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Appreciate you guys. Hope you enjoyed our special edition of The Roundup. We appreciate Representative Wallace, Representative Pfeiffer, and Senator Griffin joining us, and we'll talk to you next year.